Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to present to you this webinar series. Um, to those who just got the email with the invitation, I'm sorry about that. We've had some email issues. We will rerun the webinar series a second time starting May 20th, and I will send out the invitation to that in, starting in early May. We will take questions throughout the webinar, so please submit them via the GoToWebinar console. There's a, a specific section there that says questions. If we cannot get to the questions all throughout the webinar, we will follow up with you afterwards for sure. Uh, we are recording the webinar, and you will receive a copy of that recording or a link to that in a follow-up email. Uh, one other thing to note is that if you can't make it to all of the webinars, like I said, we are number one recording them and number two, we are going to present them again. So you can always sign up again for the second series and catch up with the one that you missed. And please feel free to forward the invitation to any colleagues or anyone you think might benefit from attending. We'd uh, definitely welcome that. So, um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the next speaker or the speaker for today, his name is Charlie Schultz and he is from Alliance Corporation, just like me. And we would like to uh, kick it off there. Charlie, would you like to start? Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, as Lisa said, thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlie Schultz. I'm responsible for the public safety and in-building program with Alliance. Uh, I'm gonna be joined in the background today with our friends Don Henry from Comba and Dave Adams from PCTEL. We're trying a little, something a little bit different, uh, necessitated, of course, by the current uh, containment orders that everybody's under. These are sessions which we would normally be doing live, which would occupy the better part of a day. So rather than trying to compress everything into an hour, we figured it's better to spread it into a three-part series where we can make sure the content is given the, the attention it deserves to, to, to get into it because we're dealing with some complex concepts, some issues that, that take time to understand. So I'm starting today where we're going to be going over at the high level. What are some of the basic requirements and code considerations that need to be factored in when doing a, a public safety deployment? Uh, next week, Don Henry is going to be talking about RF system design considerations, which is really, it's a core element of this because if you don't take that into consideration, if it's not done properly, then your system's not going to work, plain and simple. And then we're going to wrap it up on the following week with Dave Adams from PCTEL talking about testing and some of his ideas, what he's seen for best practice, because you'll see through the course of this, testing is critical both before, during, and after the deployment process. Uh, my background, or all three of us, by the way, are part of Safer Building Coalition. Safer Building Coalition is a nonprofit organization that if you're not a member and this is something that's of interest, I encourage you to check out their website. It's where people from across the board, vendors, integrators, end users, HJs, are members, all sharing a common goal of, of furthering uh, in-building communication for for the public to make it safer for first responders as well as for, for each other. I personally have a, a personal stake, and you'll find in talking with uh, Don and Dave, we all have background in public safety. I've got my lifetime as a volunteer, volunteer fireman with well over 45 years of, of service, so we understand the use case, and we've got family members, so it's, it's something we all take seriously. So with that, before I get started, Lisa, could you just do a quick poll? It's I always like to have a rough idea of what our what our audience looks like, just so I can get an idea of, of what our mix is and who we're talking to. Lisa? Lisa? Sorry, sorry, I was on mute, and then I couldn't tell you anything. I messed it up. I, I launched it, and then I closed it. So I'm sorry, we're not gonna have this answer. Okay, well, Great. I'm just gonna assume we've got a good mix of people and we're gonna move on from there. So emergency responder radio communication systems, ERCs. That's also, that's the, the fancy definition for, for public safety desks. So the first question we usually come to is, why do we need to do this in the first place? Well, we can start with the, 
the high level and the, the feel good elements that we want to, we're concerned about our first responders and we want to make sure that everybody's safe in the building. They can both call out in case of emergency as well as the responders be able to communicate with the radios. But from a practical point of view, it's because it's required by, by law in a lot of jurisdictions. It first started with the Homeland Security Act. This goes back to the days of 9-11 when the real issue of uh, interoperability and the lack of in-building coverage came to light in the, uh, the collapse of the towers. Since then, uh, NFPA, National Fire Code, and the International, uh, International Fire Code have been written to require in-building communication. And that's been picked up in a lot of building codes and building ordinances. So in, for the most part, it's across the board, almost everybody's included in a building code. Whether or not the HJs, if already having jurisdiction, has chosen to enforce it or not, that's where it's been growing. Not everybody's doing it. It's not universally accepted. But with every week that goes by, more and more jurisdictions are doing this. And at the end of the day, the HJ holds the CO, the Certificate of Occupancy. So somebody can put up a new building, but unless they've gotten it signed off by the fire department saying the radios work, there's a real good chance they're not gonna be allowed to occupy the building. Some of the acronyms, and I already started using some of these, so my, my bad for not describing, but we mentioned ERCS. That's the more formal name being assigned for public safety desks that you'll see in a lot of the specification documents from uh, HJs and and contractor documents. The HJ is the authority having jurisdiction. This is the ultimate resource for an integrator doing work who needs to know who they are and what they're looking for. These are the people who are going to approve or disapprove your project and the people who are ultimately going to be issuing responsible for issuing the certificate of occupancy. So these are critical people. They will have all the all the information you need to be able to do a deployment. These are the people you're going to have to understand their expectations if you want to be able to get the job done right. NFPA is the National Fire Protection Agency. These are, it's a code entity. They have a lot of the, a lot of you know, different fire safety codes are out there. The one of Rellins here is NFPA 72, and in particular, it's Chapter 24. The most common ones, common editions out there today in use are 2013 and 2016. Uh, it's actually up to the 2019 is what the current edition is, but it takes time for people to incorporate them in the code. Since 2016, it's been rewritten to pretty much reference everybody into NFPA 1221, chapter 9.6 is where you're gonna find the, the most recent uh, requirements. IFC is the International Fire Code. This is another code base agency depending upon your state and your jurisdiction. Uh, some people go by the IFC, some jurisdictions go by the NFPA standard, and in some they, they kind of use both of them to write their own requirements. They are all very similar um, in nature. So, you know, be familiar with both of them. If you do not have a copy, I encourage you to, to get your hands on a copy. They're not that expensive, but it's hard to be successful in this business without having a copy of the code to know what the requirements are. And of course, the last, the CO, the Certificate of Occupancy, oftentimes known as the Use and Occupancy Permit. We hear a lot of people ask, what's the difference between cellular deaths and public safety deaths? And the biggest difference, there's the two big differences. The first is for uh, your coverage areas. Uh, public safety deaths is typically concerned about providing coverage where people aren't where cellular worries about where people are. Cellular does not have any uh, code standards. In fact, cellular today is not even required by law to be in a building. It's something that's done based upon the business needs of the business owner and or the carrier. So the only guidelines they need to comply with are what the carrier wants. So they don't have any uh, coverage requirements in terms of what percentage of the building is covered. They don't have hard and fast signal levels, they don't have annual testing requirements, they don't need any sort of hardening or survivability requirements. It's just to put the coverage in to satisfy the carriers and the property owner. Public safety, on the other hand, needs to cover the whole building. They're gonna be worried about stairwells, they're gonna be worried about two-hour corridors in the back hallways in a shopping mall. 
They could be worried about restrooms because that's a, a place of refuge. Any place that's going to be an ingress or egress point. They're worried about elevators and elevator shafts. Um, any place where there could be an incident that a first responder may have to go, that's where they want to make sure that's covered. And they have hardening requirements as well. They have battery backup requirements. There are NEMA 4 enclosures that have to be, be met. There are uh, survivability for both a, a pathway and, and fire rating. So all of which add to, you know, add to the, the complexity and the cost of a public safety that you're not going to run into in a cellular system. Where are we going to find it? The most prevalent is going to be in new construction because the areas that are enforcing it, it's typically relating to new construction. And you know, depending upon the jurisdiction, there might be a size requirement. There might be a minimum square foot requirement. There could be a number of floors to the building. But there'll be a requirement that will dictate if a building is, is subject to it or not. This is where, from a business perspective, it's where the area growth is because of all the buildings that are going up. That's typically, they've got the capex for it because the price of a building or the price of putting one of these systems in is relatively small compared to the price of the building. That's much different than for the jurisdictions that are making people go back into existing buildings and retrofit, which several jurisdictions are starting to do. They had, of a, at one point, they had grandfather provisions where existing buildings were grandfathered. But several jurisdictions, that's beginning to phase out. And now they're going back to require all existing buildings. And you now go into a building that's all closed up. And this can become a very expensive proposition for people to, to try to comply with. Um, government buildings, any place it's a public gathering is likely to see it. You know, schools right now are very popular. And then unfortunately, given the, the reality that we deal with today with some of the um, mass shootings that we've seen, that's really heightened the awareness of the need to have good communications inside of school buildings. So there's school entire counties across the country that are uh, in the middle of initiatives right now to put public safety into the schools and even putting some cellular in because again when does the emergency start does it start when someone needs to call 911 or does it start when the first responder comes in so these are the areas where you're likely going to encounter it frequencies again depends on your jurisdiction your hg will know what frequency the most common frequencies you're going to run in today are 700 and 800 megahertz. Relatively speaking, they're also the, the most straightforward to implement because the, uh, the technology is, is so prevalent that all of your vendors, all of your distributors pretty much have the product you need on the shelf. So the guy who says, hey, I need something put in very quickly, you can definitely get product the next day or within a couple of days. As you go into the legacy bands, if you go into... VHF, UHF, and even the, the T-band. Now you're talking about things that tend to be very custom in nature. Um, there are, without going a lot of RF detail, you need a lot of complex filtering to make it work because there's a lot of RF traffic in that frequency band that you've got to be, you don't want to amplify anything than what you should be dealing with. So pretty much everything in this range becomes a custom product that needs to be custom tuned to the exact frequencies that you need. That means that you've got a lead time issue. So when you start talking UHF and VHF, you're easily talking four, six, eight weeks, sometimes longer, to get the product you need. So there is no such thing about putting in a UHF or VHF system within a couple of days. So plan for that if you have to deal with that. A DAS solution is a system, much like a sprinkler system in a building or a fire alarm system or anything like that. No two are alike. They all have similar, they, they may use all the same components, but the physical location, the number of components, uh, the deployment, it's all a function of the specific building or the property. It varies based upon the floor plan, the layout of the building, construction material that's used, the, the endless, the variables are endless. So if you go to someone and say, hey, give me a price for, for a BDA system, 
it's you're probably going to get asked, you know, give me the floor plan and tell me some more detail. Because if anybody doesn't, don't trust the number that they give you because you're not going to be able to depend on it. So the thing here is that all these pieces need to play together. No one vendor is going to have everything you need. Uh, a lot of vendors deal with some of it. Some vendors deal with a lot of the pieces, but nobody has all of it. So you got to make sure you're working with somebody who knows how to tie them all together so that they all play in a harmonious fashion when we're all said and done. I mentioned building material, construction material matters. And here's a good, you know, the classic picture is worth a thousand words. The other terminology, you'll hear fancy words like predictive modeling or heat map. You also hear people say buzzwords like IB Wave and RAN plan. Well, IB Wave and RAN plan are probably the two of the industry standards today for doing heat maps or predictive modeling. And this is the design tool that people use when trying to, when doing a design for a building. They start with signal readings and then they, they model the, the building. This is why you need the floor plan to see what the building layout is, to know where the cable runs will be, so you can determine where they put the antennas to make sure there's adequate coverage throughout the building. Now, these two drawings that you see are the same exact floor plan. The difference is the plan on the left. All of the interior walls are sheetrocked. The building on the right, all of the interior walls are concrete. And you notice that you see a lot more blue in the one on the right. In this case, blue is bad. When you look in the, the color codes, this is your heat map. Your fuchsia color has got the strongest signal. And as you go down into the blue, purple, and black region, that's where you have weaker signal that's probably going to fail. So you can see that the building on the left, using all sheetrock, it looks fine. The building on the right, because of the fact they had more concrete in it, which blocks the uh, the transmission of the, the RF signal, you are going to need more antennas to be able to get the coverage. Your biggest obstacle, your biggest um, blockers for RF in a building today is concrete, steel, and the low E glass, your low energy glass. Charlie, so we talked sorry, Charlie, it's Lisa. I've got one question. Yes. Is there a standard inspection and testing form that is recognized by the govern governing standards? Is there a standard inspection testing inspection form? Uh, I'm going to say not yet. Um, there are testing requirements and there are testing guidelines, which Dave Adam, Dave, are you out there? Do you want to you want to talk to this one? I know you're going to be talking more in a couple of weeks, but Dave. He's just okay. Him. No, he's there. Give him a chance. Okay. All right, I'm here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, um, from a testing part of the documentation, um, we've not seen anybody that created a standard in the codes or anywhere else. In fact, very few HJs will say this is exactly the way it needs to look. We have developed our own that is kind of a, a conglomeration of lots of best practices we've seen over the years at different HJs. And so it's kind of becoming a de facto standard in some places, but um, really you just have to reflect what's in the testing part of the codes to say this is what they need to see documented. And uh, that's what we did, so. Thank you, Dave. Now I think the, the other thing to keep in mind is that these codes, especially the NFPA and IFC, these are model codes, or these are recommended guidelines. In HJ, you know, a local jurisdiction, their building codes will decide what to invoke and what words to use. And then the, the biggest challenge, I think, facing the industry is that the HJ then interprets the code to what they feel it means. And I don't want to say they're judge, jury, and executioner, but the HJ is the one who's ultimately responsible for signing off. So they tend to get 51% of the vote. Now you can try to get into debates over your interpretation of the code versus their interpretation of the code. Sometimes that works to your advantage, sometimes it doesn't. So 
we're we're a long way, and we we may never get standardization across the board for all areas. This is why you've really got to know what is your local AHJ expect and what are they looking for, so you can meet the needs of your local guy or gal. We good, Lisa? That's great. Thank you. Okay. We mentioned the the codes and the standards. Now I'm really condensing this down because if you were to attend a like a safer building code training workshop what i'm putting into a couple of three or four slides would be the better part of three or four hours because there's that much material to go through so this is really boiling it down and we can certainly work with people afterwards on one-on-one -on -one for more detail but things you got to bear in mind is the coverage area the codes are going to typically talk in terms of needing 95% coverage in all areas. Sometimes they're going to say 99% coverage in the critical areas, with a critical area being defined as EHJ. And that's where you're going to find things like storage rooms, mechanical rooms, stairwells, and the likes. Um, signal strength. The magic number for public safety is neg 95 dB for minimal, minimal signal strength, regardless of the frequency. That was in play up until the codes of 2016. When NFPA 1221 came out, they went from the, uh, a power level reading to what they call DAQ, the Deliberate Audio Quality. And I'll talk to that in the next slide, or in a slide or two, but DAQ becomes a very subjective element. It becomes a, a form of, can you hear me now? That created problems for people because that's the ultimate test of can does your radio actually work and you can hear people but it's very very difficult to design, design to because it's, there's no positive design tool a predictive modeling tool designs rf signals and not audio quality so the codes in 19 or 2019 brought back the power level so now it requires both the power level and the digital audio quality <coughs> excuse me delivered audio quality you also have survivability. Everything needs to be in NEMA 4 or 4X enclosures, all of your active gear. If you have filters, they're going to want filters in an enclosure. Um, they want your battery backup units to be in an enclosure. They have relaxed now to where they're saying you can buy with a NEMA 3R because they realize that a fully sealed enclosure for a battery that vents um, hazardous gas is probably not a good idea. Uh, you're going to have auxiliary power requirements. Depending upon the version of the code and what the jurisdiction is, it's going to be looking for a generator and or a battery backup. For any, can it be anywhere from 24 to 12 or to two hours, depending. What a lot of places, a lot of codes now are going to, if you've got a battery backup or if you have a generator, then you can get by with either two hours or 12 hours of battery backup. They still want both because if the generator fails or if they kill the uh, electrical circuit, they still want a battery backup in place to keep the system alive. They also want things monitored. They're going to want local monitoring through enunciator panels, and they're going to want it tied into supervisory alarms on the building's monitored fire alarm system. So if you are not familiar with fire alarms, there's a good chance that as part of your, part of your installation, you may have to sub and contract out part of it to a fire alarm guy to help you interface your, your system to the fire alarm panel to meet that part of the requirement. And there's uh, survivability in the cabling requirements. They're looking at your, your backbone or your vertical, your riser, to be in two-hour enclosures. Good chance they're going to want it in conduit. Uh, your horizontals or your feeders. Uh, depending upon how the HJ interprets it, they're going to want that in conduit as well. Sorry, and part of this, but question. Yeah. Um, what are the points that the fire alarm panel? Sorry, I'm not reading it correctly. What are the points the fire alarm panel is monitoring? There are seven alarm points. I think I've got a slide. Uh, next slide or two, we'll we'll go over what those points are. Okay, thanks. 
So stand by. The part of the conduit is as much mechanical protection as anything. When, from a practical point of view, when you consider over the life of a building, what a building goes through, the building's got more of a threat from the sawzall or a drill that's going to take place during remodeling than, than the god awful fire that we planned for. So what we want to make sure of is that if somebody's doing some remodeling and slices the saws all through the wall, that it hits the conduit and not the cable. So it preserves the, the system and doesn't take half the system down without anybody realizing it. All right, Charlie, I've got another question. Uh, doesn't type, yeah. don't type four enclosures replace NEMA four? I, depending upon how it's written, type four and NEMA four might be viewed as synonymous, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, the question on monitoring. These are the basic points that tie into the fire alarm system for a supervisory alarm. So you're, uh, several of them come from the battery backup unit. You've got the battery charger. Loss of AC supply is going to come from your battery backup. The battery charger failure, as well as low battery. You're going to have a donor antenna malfunction. So there's going to be circuitry that monitors the health, the, the continuity from the donor antenna down through the BDA. And there could be failure of critical system components. It's typically referring to if there's a failure in the active gear. Uh, there is technology out there today that allows you to do end to end. You can go off and monitor out to the actual server antennas in the building. The solution is not necessarily cheap, but if you've got an HGA that requires it, for the longest time there was no solution, but today there's at least two vendors out there that offer solutions that will fill that need if you have an HGA requiring it. DAQ, just for reference here, the codes are going to look for either a category of uh, rating of 3 to 3.4. It basically says that with either no repetition or allowing one repeat, that you can be understood. And they discourage using the can you hear me now or radio check. They have what they call Harvard sentences. The, there's a, a listing out there of sentences that go through enough, you know, the sentences comprise of words that use enough of the different phonetic sounds in the vocabulary that if you can read one of these sentences and be understood, then you've got a good, you've got a good system. Because when you say, can you hear me now, if you do it for about 20 or 30 times, you're no longer hearing the words, you just know what it should be, and your, your brain's responding and not necessarily hearing. So this is also why they went back to having a fixed power level in the specs, because depending upon the, you know, depending upon the hearing of the people doing the test, What's perfectly intelligible to one person could be unintelligible to someone else. So it's a lot of subjectivity in this model. Okay, well, that's a very quick overview of the of what's makes what's involved in a public safety system. Now some thoughts for how to do a successful deployment. And I'm not going to read these 12 points. You all can, can see that. Um, what I will talk to just a couple of things. We cannot stress enough the need to understand who the HJ is and what are the requirements of a jurisdiction. Many HJs have written guidelines that either they put on the web or they make it available for anybody who asks them. And that document will tell them the frequencies. They'll tell them their expectations of, for a donor antenna. They've got any unique um, bandwidth or beam width requirements. They'll let them know if they've got where the, the towers are that you've got to find the signal from. They will, anything you need to know, you do your deployment, your HJ will have that. So you want to make sure you know who they are and you've connected with them, because otherwise you can't be sure that, that what you're doing is going to be right. What worked in, in, in one town may not be acceptable in the next town. You're also going to be working with them to figure out who gets the rebroadcast agreement. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide or two. But the rebroadcast agreements are critical, and that's going to come from the FCC license holder and not the HJ. 
We also see testing in here a lot. Testing is important because you don't know how much you, of, of enhancement you need without knowing what your baseline is that you start from. Now, modern construction today, it's a pretty safe bet your building's gonna be dark because I mentioned earlier, concrete, steel, and uh, low E glass are the enemy of RF, they block everything. Well, that's pretty much everything that's going into a modern day building. So more than likely your signal falls off about three feet inside of the building. So you start off assuming the building's gonna be dark, you're gonna do another reading Typically, once the building's closed up, once you've got the, wind, the exterior windows and doors, once that's all been put in place, the building's pretty much sealed from an RF perspective. You'll have all of your concrete interior walls. If you're going to have a stairwell or an elevator shaft, you're going to have all your concrete in place to where you can walk the building and get a pretty good feel for what, what areas are good and what areas are in need of help. And then that'll factor in how you do your design where you need antennas and where you don't need antennas. And of course, once you're finished, you're gonna to have to test it again to make sure that it actually works the way you expected it to. And then you're probably gonna to have to come back and do annual inspections if the EHJ requires that. So it's a very, very high level, kind of step-by-step, step, but this is these are the steps you're gonna be going through in some way, shape, shape or form. Carly, I have a question there. Um... Is there a good list of questions we can ask AHJs to achieve a good design? I'm sorry, repeat, Lisa. Is there a good list of questions we can ask to AHJs to achieve a good design? The most is there a good list of questions to ask? Yeah. The most important question to ask is, do you have written guidelines of what you expect? That's the most, because if they do, then that document will tell you everything you need to know. If they don't have that, then you're the most, at the absolute minimum, you're gonna to wanna to ask, you know, go through the code and ask them what their expectation is. What are the, you need to know what the frequencies are that they're worried about. You need to know where their towers are located. You need to know what their battery backup expectations are. You need to know what version of the code they're enforcing. So those are the types of questions you want to be asking. Okay. Um, one more question. Uh, so is protocol? Sorry. So protocol is three test. I'm not sure what that means. Well, yeah. You're going to you're going to test to figure out before you do the design to know what you need to do. Once the building's complete, you're going to have to walk do a walk test. And again, Dave Adams will talk more to this in two weeks. But once the building's complete. You're going to have to do a walk test. You're going to have to take signal readings, and that's going to be part of your your closeout package that you're going to have to submit to show that, yep, we did what we said we were going to do, and here's what the test results are. And then many HJs require you to come back and retest it every so many years to make sure that nothing's happened. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay, thank you. Now we're gonna, Don Henry's gonna go into more of this next week, but at a very high level, one of the biggest things you're gonna need to figure out is what sort of a signal booster does your HJ want? Are they okay with a class B or do they want a class A? At the basic level, a class A is also known as a channelized signal booster. They have very narrow signal, or very narrow filters, so they only pass specific channels. Um, no passband is going to exceed 75 kilohertz. A class B is considered a broadband booster. You're going to have passbands larger than 75 kilohertz. It's typically less expensive than a class A, but you must register it with the FCC prior to operation. Now, why do you have to do that? It's because if there was an improper, if you didn't design your system properly and you put a wideband amplifier, amplifier, you can not only have adverse impact on the public safety network that you're working on, but you could impact other people that are in that same spectrum. There are other users in the 800 megahertz space besides public safety. There's a lot of public utilities, um, water companies, uh, private companies, bus companies, trucking companies have spectrum in that space. 
if you put a class B amplifier out there and you suddenly start creating noise on a network that spills over into the frequencies occupied by other people, then you have a problem and the FCC is not going to be too, too happy about. They're going to want to come back and they're going to figure out, they're going to want to know where's the source of the interference. They're going back to the FCC license holder and say, you got a problem, turn your system off until you fix it. Uh, this is why you want to make sure you know who holds the license. It's not necessarily the HJ. For example, you might be in an area where the HJ is the fire department, but the radio system itself, the license from the FCC for the radio system could be issued to the county or the city or maybe a regional radio authority like that, uh, that many jurisdictions are going in on. So it's whoever's name is on that SCC license, they're the only people who can authorize you to retransmit on their spectrum. And they're the people that are going to ultimately be responsible. So the HJ, make sure that you've gotten from the HJ who the frequency license holder is and that the HJ is authorized by them to sign. Otherwise, you need to, to get the license holder involved as well. Charlie, I've just got a comment here from somebody. He says, in IFC 2015 edition, 510.6.1 states annual testing is required or when building changes are made, additional testing is needed. Yes. It's written in the code, but it goes, unfortunately, and, and I hate to say this, guys, but it's the reality of where, where the industry is right now, so it's still evolving. Roads have speed limit signs, too, but that doesn't always mean that they're, they're being enforced. So there are things like that can be in the code, but HJs suffer from bandwidth and manpower. Some HJs, some of the more progressive HJs are on top of their game. They require the testing, and they hold people to it. They tie it into the annual fire alarm and fire sprinkling test. Other HJs, they're just happy they got a system installed. Um, and once they get that process under control, they come back and worry about testing later, usually after a system failed. So again it varies it varies by hj okay that's awesome thank you okay so the the class b the registration ideally i've heard different stories on this ideally the hj or the license holder should be the ones that register it because they you know you'll see when you get to the information on this page for registering they're going to want to know who do we call? Because if there's if you flip the switch on your system and somebody's radio network stops working and they go to the FCC, the FCC is going to look and say, well, who just put a system in? And they're going to call that contact person and say, hey, whatever you did, turn it off. So this is why it's typically done by the license holder. So there's a the website you go to, signalboosters.fcc.gov slant signal boosters. And you know, your HJ should be well familiar with this. If you went and looked yourself, you can look for areas and jurisdictions. You can see where all the signal boosters are installed in your area that have been registered, at least the class B ones. And this would be an example of the information that they, they look for. I did this one near where I live, but you've got what the frequencies are. You can see the, the license holder and all of their contact information. So there's a problem. They know who they're going to. Very important element because this is beyond anything that the HJ, this is the FCC. So I guess coming into the end, I'm going to go back and stress again, know what your HJ wants. Um, to the question earlier about key questions, these could be questions to ask. What are the bands and frequencies that they, they're worried about being covered? And to just be told, I need UHF or I need VHF, that's not good enough. You need to know the uplink and downlink or the transmit and receive frequencies for each frequency pair that they want enhanced. And when you go into UHF and VHF, the more frequency pairs, the price starts to go up exponentially because of the filtering. So if you didn't pay attention to this in the bid process, you know, your ten to fifteen thousand dollar BDA could become a fifty thousand dollar BDA. So you want to take the time to get this information and get it right the first time because it can have a big impact 
on the price of the, the product in the system. You're going to want to know the areas that need coverage. So you're going to make sure you need the floor plan and an idea of what the signal levels are. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. Assume it's going to be dark, and then hopefully from there you can you can uh, maybe get by with less as the, the the walls and windows and doors go up, and you see what your actual signals are. Know what they want from survivability and alarming. Do they want lo a local enunciator as well as monitoring through the, the fire alarm panel, or are all they concerned about is the fire alarm? Backup, do they want 12 hour, do they want 24 hour, do they need two hour? And if this hasn't made it compl complex enough, you want to stay connected with your HGA because this can all change. The project that the rules that they used last, you know, last month could change this month. And I've heard horror stories from integrators who come back and say that they've had HGAs that have changed their requirements in the middle of a project. And something that wasn't required when they started the job, they decided they needed it before the job was finished. And since it wasn't there, the HGA wouldn't sign off on it. So make sure you have relationships and make sure you stay in touch because you know changes and surprises can be costly. And I guess in closing for us, you're not sure where to go? Feel free to give us a call, give me a call, give your Alliance account manager. We deal with, we're a distributor, so we deal with multiple vendors. We deal with lots of integrators. I like to I like to look at us as being the proverbial matchmaker. We're good at finding chocolate and peanut butter. If this is something you're into and you need help in an area, we can match you up with a partner that won't represent a competitive threat, but rather will complement what your core competencies are that will allow you to go off and successfully bid and execute these projects. Uh, we work with some world-class vendors. We've got some of the best going. We've got our friends with Combo. Uh, we've got probably one of the industry standards in the the testing of ERC systems with our friends at PCTEL. Uh, they're each are going to have a, a good story to tell in the next two weeks. So I would encourage each of you to hang in there. And then we will probably even, there's been a lot of talk recently of a new product from another vendor from RFS with a new two-hour plenum. And I'm not going to try to steal anybody's thunder, but look for that being the next in our series where we're going to be having our vets come in to talk about their new Dragon Skin two-hour coax. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Open it to whatever questions Lisa has. Yes, I do have one question. And if anybody wants to start submitting, if there's any other questions you want to have answered. Um, the first question I have is what spectrum bands does the Class A, Class B Part 90 reg apply to? Don, all right, you out there, do you want to take that one? Don Henry? Yeah, hi, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, it's going to apply to any frequency band, um, whether it's 700 or 800 or UHF. Or, or VHF. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, just one other question. Oh, they're coming in. Uh, are you, oh, are we going to get a certificate for this? Um, not officially, but we probably could do one, I guess. Yeah. We'll figure that out afterwards. I'll let everyone know. Um, can you say anything about 700 LTE FirstNet? Oh, wow. Um, what is there to say about FirstNet? The answer is yes, it's out there. Um, FirstNet is alive and well, but all the focus on FirstNet to date has been at the macro level. It's been focused on getting coverage at the macro through the outdoor. Um, it's recently surfaced, the I guess the light bulb went off that there's going to be a growing need to have first net coverage in building. In fact, there's at least one HJ. Uh, it's actually Washington, D.C.'s Office of Unified Communication has expressed a desire to require first net coverage inside of their buildings. They've had to put that requirement on hold because right now the ATT first net team does not have a 
viable solution that they recommend slash approve for wide scale deployment of FirstNet indoors. Um, they're working on it. They understand the need. They understand the the rationale behind it. Uh, they're they're working on something. It's at the highest levels of both AT and T and FirstNet, and it's something that the industry and Safer Building Coalition and a lot of our core vendors are are involved in the in the planning and the coordination meetings. But we do not have a good answer for that yet. So stay tuned. I wish I could say more. So, uh, Charlie, if, if if I may uh, to add a little bit of, of additional info, it's, it's important for everyone to understand that FirstNet was designed to provide high-speed broadband data service to first responders. Uh, FirstNet is not intended to replace critical voice communications. There are some vendors that are working on push-to-talk um, solutions to provide voice over FirstNet, um, but it was never intended to replace good old conventional land mobile radio and two-way radios. Um, I think everyone who has a cell phone knows that, you know, a lot of times bad connection, you can't understand people, the calls drop, all the issues that, that unfortunately are, are part of the cellular world. Uh, 700 band 14 first net is part of the overall cellular spectrum and as such operates on pretty much conventional cellular technology. And so for that reason, you know, talk to a fireman, talk to a policeman who's in a critical situation. They'll tell you, no, I want to pick up my radio, push that huge push to talk button and know that my call is going to go through and I'm going to be able to get the backup or, or help that, that I need and have it happen immediately. So again, FirstNet is, is, is still a very nascent thing. As Charlie mentioned, there's a lot of things still being figured out. We certainly, as a, as a vendor of products that supports LMR, you know, we certainly are excited about you know, FirstNet for the future because these first responders do need high-speed broadband data that they can rely on. But again, I just wanted to point out it's not intended nor does anyone see, at least for a very, 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 very long time, that it would ever replace two-way radios for critical, urgent voice communications. Thank you, Don. Thank you. That's awesome, both of you. Um, I have a few more questions here. Um, the first one is, can you do a design, and what is the cost? So I'm going to let Charlie answer that. Alliance, we're, first of all, Alliance does not do designs. Mainly because, well, for two reasons. One, we're a distributor, we're not a design house. Number two, a lot of our clients, a lot of our customers and integrators do design. Mm -hmm. So we prefer not to compete with our, uh, with our customers. With that said, we do have access to a network of independent contractors who have some very cost-effective um, rates for doing public safety designs, IB wave designs, and all of our vendors We'll do, they'll work with us to do a ROM uh, of rough order magnitude, which is typically adequate for the bid process. So people will typically will work with a vendor to do a ROM to get you through the bid process. Uh, you include money in your bid for design. And then if you win the project, then you can come back and we match you up with our contractor that can do the design for you. Awesome. That's really great. Uh, next question. Is there a part of the code that demands that you run your feeder cable in conduit? Uh, Charlie, you want me to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the right words are. You try, Don. <laughs> okay, so f first of all, you know, there's different uh, interpretations of many things. If feeder means the coax that's connecting the donor antenna on the roof to the BDA. Um, generally, no. They will want to see that the uh, uh, two-hour fire rated, and that can be uh, either by putting that in a two-hour fire rated chaseway, or, you know, Charlie mentioned there's a, a company called RFS that's now uh, developed some two-hour fire rated coax. If feeder coax refers to the horizontal runs that go from the BDA out to the service antennas located throughout the building. 
Some jurisdictions require it to be in conduit and some don't. You know, as, as Charlie mentioned, and in my presentation next week, we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. You know, make sure you understand what the jurisdiction requires and make sure you find out before you've done the project. It's much better than finding out afterwards. Um, again, some require horizontal to be in conduit, some don't. Some require the horizontal to be to our fire rated, some don't. It just, again, just depends on what that local ordinance from that local jurisdiction uh, specifies or requires. And how they choose to interpret it. Okay, thank you. Exactly. Next question. Where is UL 2524 on a national level of implementation and enforcement? We're going to see UL 2524 will start to appear in the the next editions of the codes that are coming out. So like the 2020 and 2021 editions are where we're going to see it formally being invoked. Um, so, well, that's when it's going to show up in the code. Now, from a practical point of view, that just because the new version of the code came out doesn't mean it's been written into local building codes because Typically, if building codes lag three, five years behind the actual fire codes because of the political process it takes to to rewrite things. So there's a lag time unless the HJ chooses to adopt a newer code. So the building code might require, for example, let's say the building codes require 2016. The HJ has the ability to accept the, 20, the requirements of the 2019 version of the code if it's used in its entirety. You can't take one from column A and one from column B, you know, and take, well, gee, I like this part of 2016 and that part of 2019. They don't allow that, but they may decide to say the newer code is a better than, so even what, despite what's written into the building codes, the HGA may require a more current code. So it's coming. It's very, it's very real. It's coming, and by the time it hits out there, pretty much all of the major manufacturers, if they're not 2524 compliant today, they're well on their way. The, it's mainly the, the testing time because there's a big backlog in the nurdles to, to get the testing done. But by the time these codes are, are published and released, I don't see that being an issue for anyone. Okay, Charlie, thank you. One one last question. Um, above what square footage requires going to a fiber DAS instead of a BDA? Don, you want to take this one? Yeah, I will, Charlie. So um, it's oftentimes more